All right, welcome. This is our educational webinar for the week. Um, we had one last week on COVID. Usually we have one per month. I feel like my life has been lived on webinars the last couple of months. So um, <laughs> this one is Mold 101, a naturopathic perspective on mold identification, testing, and treatment. We have the wonderful and illustrious Dr. Jill Krista here with us tonight. Um, she's a naturopathic doctor. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, and then I'm going to sort of just hand it off to her and let her take off running um, and tell you all about it. I've, I've seen her slides, and I'm super excited for tonight. I think this is going to be a great webinar. Um, so Dr. Krista is a naturopathic doctor. She's also a best-selling author. She's an internationally recognized educator on mold illness, um, helping people recover their health after exposure to toxic, toxic mold. She's the author of Break the Mold, Five Tools to Conquer Mold and Take Back Your Health, which is a great book. Um, if you're a mold practitioner or you see patients with mold-related problems, I highly recommend this book. Um, she actually gave us a copy or two at A4M, I think is where I first met you, Dr. Hudson, mm -hmm. this past winter. Um, and I was like really blown away. I mean, just she's super knowledgeable about this topic. And she also has an online training program for medical practitioners to help them become mold literate um, for identifying mold in their patients as well as treating those mold sick patients. And there is a link to her um, website where you can access that course as well as some of her other content. Um, now we will make the recording available. We always make the recording available to anybody who's registered as well as in our portal. If you are a provider with an account with us, you can log in and view it on demand. And we do make these slides available for download. So before anybody asks, that's usually the first question we get is, are the slides going to be available? Yes, they will. Um, so if you do not have a chance to write down the link or any of her information, don't worry. Um, we are also going to email some information to you. Um, usually we get an email out within a couple of days. If you do have questions during the webinar, type them into the Q&A or the chat um, and we will get to them. We're going to save like 10 minutes or so at the end for Dr. Krista to go through and answer questions for you. So that being said, Dr. Krista, welcome. I'm so excited. I think everyone else is really excited too. Um, so welcome and, and take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for the honor of um, getting a chance to give my perspective on this whole mold thing. Absolutely. I do have one question for you, Sarah. Do you want me to be sharing my video? Yes. I'm ready to share video as well. Um, that's part of this. Actually, we normally have video turned off. Um, okay. So yeah, you're, right. you're good. You don't have good to work. To you can go. be in your pajamas if you want. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should see the outfit I have today. Just kidding. Okay. So <laughs> Thank you so much. And I hope that this perspective is fresh and helpful for people that are looking for another perspective on mold. The naturopathic perspective, I was trained by Dr. Walter Crinian and Dr. Lynn Patrick and many of the, many of the naturopathic doctors, teachers had, um, before me. And so I really want to um, give them a little prayer hands of, of thanks for everything they shared with me so I could help my patients. And so I'm hoping that this is something that you're approaching this with. This is just an approach. This is an approach that I developed after years of working with Lyme and mold and complex chronic conditions and sort of developed my own approach and protocol or way of, of um, coming about mold related illness after I finally discovered that that's what I was dealing with. So our objective today is to understand the mechanisms behind mold related illness. If you understand this, you understand all of it. Um, and then learn to recognize the mold symptoms. Again, once you understand the mechanisms, those mold symptoms are going to start to make sense of why it looks a certain way and why it can look different ways in different people. I also want to offer you my first tier lab assessment list, what I go through on a typical patient. Um, I would like you to have some of the understanding of the limitations of testing and then how to overcome those so that you're getting the best results for your patient. I'm going to offer you a therapeutic order for treatment to consider. This is what the therapeutic order is really what makes my method stand out and be different because it's very naturopathic. And then I would like you to understand my rationale for using both systemic and intranasal antifungals when we're dealing with a mold related illness patient. And then if we have time, we'll hit a sample case. Let's dive in. By the way, I'm going to be giving you little nature breaks 
throughout this talk so that everybody can go from the head space to the heart space. So there's our nature break. All right, so mold is so much more than spore illness. If you look on the CDC's website, they are going to be defining mold illness as basically what I'm considering spore illness or spore related illness or the, the symptoms that can come from interacting with spores. That's gonna be your IgE medi mediated mold illness. And that's a part, uh, definitely a part of this whole mold illness thing. But mold illness is so much more than that. So there is, IgE is things we know, allergic rhinitis, asthma, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, so basically irritable lungs, non-IgE asthma exacerbation. And then if you have an infection with a spore, that's true aspergillosis. And we typically, in medicine, we sort of have this understanding that um, people only have aspergillosis if they are either end-stage cancer or HIV or some sort of drastic immune deficiency. What we've learned now is that there can be this idea of colonization, and we'll go into that. So what are the other mold dangers? Mycotoxins. These are very energetically expensive for mold. This is basically a toxic gas bomb to compete out other microbes, other molds, but also bacteria. And we know about these mycotoxins because that's what we use as antibiotics. Many mold or many antibiotics are actually mold mycotoxins. That's what the mold is doing is trying to defend its territory once it finds a sweet spot in a house, which is just cluttered, dusty, the food source that it wants and a little extra humidity. Doesn't need moisture, just needs humidity because mold can grow on any surface within 24 to 48 hours of too much humidity. So the other problem with mold is it secretes these chemicals as part of its normal daily living. This is aldehydes, alcohols, VOCs, and MPA or mycophenolic acid. MPA is not a mycotoxin. It is a toxin that is related to a happily living metabolizing mold. A mycotoxin is related to a mold that is now being invaded by other species. So where there are mycotoxins, typically you're going to find multiple species of mold and other bacteria that want to move into that, that water damaged building. So you get the point that what we know now about water damaged buildings is there is expanded microbial diversity and they do act in a quorum sensing way so that there is competition and um, collaboration for survival. So this is our respiratory system versus mold. I put this picture from my book in here because it, I felt like it was the most simple way to say spores can only get so far, fragments can get a little deeper, and these are when a spore has dried and died and somebody tries to clean it up on their own without using PPE. And then mycotoxins are ultra small. They're 50 times smaller than the smallest spore. They can go right through the alveoli into our blood system, and that's how people get sick from mold from the mycotoxin part. So if you look at the respiratory system, what we're talking here versus the mold spore versus the fragment size versus the mycotoxin, our alveoli are about one micron or a little less than that. Mycotoxins are 0 0.1, itty bitty. And that's how we, that's why we don't really have defenses against it. And it doesn't matter if you're a tough guy or not, everybody's lungs are built the same. Everybody can absorb these mycotoxins. Here are some of the mycotoxins that we can test for at this time, and then the related molds that they come from. This really gives you help when you're looking at testing, like the urine mycotoxin testing, to try to identify where to go searching into the house um, to find where that mold might be a problem or into the building. It could be their work, could be their gym, could be their church, could be lots of places, but usually it's where they're gonna be spending the majority of their time. So I'm not going to go through each individual one of these. In my doctor course or my training course, I do go through each of the mycotoxins and its affinity for the body. In the case that we're going to be talking about, we'll be talking about two of these and you get the idea of how we can look at specific mycotoxins and start to do some prediction on the body having its hard time. <sighs> Nature break. Look at that little bee, he's so cute. Okay, so what are the health impacts of mycotoxins? All mycotoxins are different. Each one has its own, like I said, affinity for the body. Each one has its own biological diversity. So what I tried to do for this is to lump in, in this first section, what all mycotoxins do, the thing that is consistent about all of them and where one strays, I've noted that. So they are all 
immunotoxic, neurotoxic, dermatoxic means to the skin, alimentary canal toxic, so from the mouth to the anus, nephrotoxic, hepatotoxic, hepatocarcinogenic, teratogenic, carcinogenic, and genotoxic. These things can affect bodies at the gene level. That's why we get into so much trouble because they rewire us to be more wimpy. They rewire our immune systems. They are all lipophilic. This is so important to remember when we start to think about where they can go in the body and how to get them out. They are all inflammatory to the sinuses and the lung tissues, all the respiratory passages, and you can actually get airway remodeling if it's persistent. So if someone is in a building and all the spores and fragments are locked behind building material, the mycotoxins can seep through that building material because they're 50 times smaller. So they sort of um, gradiently go to the less toxic area and that can poison the indoor air. And the person exposed to that mycotoxin air can actually have airway remodeling even if they didn't have exposure to the spore or the fragment. Stachybotrys, that's our classic black mold. That will alter phospholipid synthesis related to surfactant. So what the, what the stachy is trying to do is actually make your lungs hyperinflate so that you don't resist it. It's kind of creepy. All are um, cause inflammation, irritation, and ulceration of mucosal linings. So think respiratory system, think GI. So this is our um, eosinophilic esophagitis. This might even be some cases of ulcerative colitis and to the bladder. So we see a lot of interstitial cystitis sort of look. All induce apoptosis of the intestinal epithelial cells. This can cause a celiac type look when there's actually no gluten sensitivity at all. So it can mimic that glyphosate change that happens in the, the epithelial cells. All, and particularly fumosinin, but um, this can also happen with a couple other mycotoxins, but particularly from fusarium, this decreases your phosphatidylcholine ratio of the hepatocyte lipid rafts, which makes the, the cells of the hepatocytes more rigid and it can no longer take in the nutrients it needs or expel the waste products that it needs to get rid of. All are detox via phase one via the cytochrome P450 system. And that's gonna be very interesting when we talk about treatment. They're also detox in phase two, via glutathione S transferase conjugation with reduced glutathione. So ergo, all deplete glutathione. They also deplete NERF2 over time. So because of the excessive oxidative stress that they cause and the inflammation that it causes, you get a boosting of NERF2 and then an eventual depletion. Because a lot of us think, oh, NERF2, NERF2, that's what we want. Um, and it's an inflammatory marker, so that's what we want to actually quell. But when we're treating mold, we want to actually restore normal NERF2 levels. Protein synthesis inhibitors are um, all of the mycotoxins, but particularly the trichothecenes from Stachybotrys, Fusarium. And I want you to think about what that means across the whole body. So you've got a lipophilic toxin that impedes protein synthesis, which means actin and myosin. You can get skeletal muscle loss, heart muscle damage, Keratin and elastin, you can get aging, you can get sagging, look like you're going into andropause or menopause. You can get loss of hair. Um, enzymes, so you get a slowed function of enzymes. Heme is a protein that we see depleted in mold sensitivity. DNA, RNA, everywhere where there's a protein in the body, you can see depletion when you're exposed to a mold toxic building. All mycotoxins cause mitochondrial damage. So you can see mitochondrial dysfunction issues that can almost look like um, a fatigue. And then you add in the fact that it's neurotoxic and it can look sort of like an MS. You can see dementia. You can see all kinds of mitochondria, the brain, nervous system, heart, everywhere. All will interfere with vital cellular processes and most are cytotoxic. Some of them cross the blood brain barrier and reduce its integrity and the What's very interesting is through inhalation of these, we actually see that these mycotoxins ride the olfactory nerve to the hippocampus and the frontal lobe. I actually had one patient with melanoma who had um, metastasis. He had a 12 year exposure to a moldy building and developed melanoma, which I want someone to do some research on sometime to see the connection between black mold and black cancer, black skin cancer. Um, and he had a, an, um, metastasis to the frontal lobe and the hip, hippocampus, exactly. Many will cross the placenta, bioactivate in utero, which is frightening, and are found in breast milk. So for me with my pregnant patients, I am 
like an avoidance, get out of the mold Nazi, because I just think there is no room for causing birth defects. Uh, if we know that these guys bioactivate in utero, so I'm very pushy with my pregnant patients. All the immune impacts are really impressive, actually. Scary impressive, but impressive. Mold mycotoxins are immunosuppressive in three ways. They cause a direct action on the immune cells, so those polymorphonuclear cells that are flying around our, our periphery, it will kill them on contact. Epigenetic alterations to the immune response and then direct alterations by changing and rewiring the genes. All mycotoxins inhibit host defenses by causing hypofunction in the natural killer cells. They can cause T and B cell deficiencies if longstanding. And a long-term exposure, especially to um, gliotoxin, which can also be secreted from candida, can cause an IgG subclass three deficiency. And we will see an IgG deficiency um, causing a false negative mold allergy test, the IgE test, and um, also infection labs. So if someone's been exposed to mold, they can get a negative Lyme test, for example, a negative EBV test, even though they have chronic Lyme and chronic EBV. They deplete the white blood count. We will see a relative lymphopenia with neutrophilia and eosinophilia. This is very relative. These aren't falling out of the normal range, but this is something where if you have pre-WC numbers on a person, then they had their mold exposure, you might see this change and that's a trend. This is something I used to really rely on before I had urine mycotoxin testing. We'll see TGF beta increase. We can see that from other things too, like Lyme disease. And that increase will cause an immune overactivation, asthma, that kind of thing. And we'll see a disordered GALT or the gut associated lymphoid tissue and intestinal apoptosis. So I want to create a new math for mold. Spore symptoms plus mycotoxin symptoms, and actually plus chemical symptoms, is the totality of mold sickness. The problem is there's no single symptom that's diagnostic of mold illness. So here are a few of the symptoms I just kind of put on from the most common to the most severe um, in the respiratory system, the digestive system, the immune system, the neurological system. So the respiratory system, we're talking the most common, which is like sinusitis, sore throat, post-nasal drip, maybe uh, this is really common to see serositis media, um, hay fever, sometimes polyps, sometimes shortness of breath, sometimes a wheeze and a cough. Asthma is going to be getting more into the long-standing exposure or a pre-sensitized person that also is interacting with the spores and the fragments. But someone can have sinusitis just from mycotoxin exposure. Digestively, we might see food allergies, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and then it gets more, more severe into the intestinal epithelial blunting, looking like a celiac patient. Immune, you can see anything going from allergies and frequent colds all the way to cancer. Neurologically, we see a lot of neurological changes with mold mycotoxins. So think about it, it makes sense. It's fat soluble. They are fat soluble and our nervous system and our brain is fat. You know, most of our brain is just a big old fat head. So you can see depression, headache, migraines, all the way to dementia and tremors. An oddity of mold toxin illness is tinnitus or ear ringing. It's very common. And think about it, antibiotics are one of the highest class of drugs to cause tinnitus. Cutaneously, we can see itching, rashes. Itching is a very particular um, keynote symptom of having mold or fungal overgrowth. All the way to desquamation, we will see some people actually, their skin starts to peel off itself. Vascular, you'll see frigidity, atonia, someone that looks like a POTS kind of problem because you have the vascular fragility and the vessel atonia and the um, neurological shutdown. Detoxification, you'll see chemical sensitivity all the way to liver pain. It's a very common symptom of someone with long-standing mold exposure and related chemical sensitivity. They'll say their liver hurts or this, this space right here on my right, underneath my right ribs. Um, or bloating feeling on the right-hand side, upper quadrant. Urologically, you'll see frequency, urgency, again, interstitial cystitis, KPU, all the way to an ADH resistance. And the ADH resistance is very interesting. Not only does mold reduce your ability to make ADH because of its effect on your pituitary, it actually causes a resistance at the kidney level. So these people, I say the water that takes the fast track. So they can drink water and they literally have to pee two minutes later. That's a mold thing. It can also be TBI, by the way, if their ADH is shut down. But the ADH resistance at the kidney is a very interesting mold-specific thing. 
Endocrine wise, we can see menstrual cycle changes, low T infertility in both genders. So what, you know, that's a lot of symptoms and that could be lots of other things. Probably as you were reading through those, you're thinking, well, that could be adrenal fatigue. Well, that could be this, that could be food allergies. That could be that. So what I did in my practice just to create sanity for myself because I was seeing chronic Lyme patients is I took the inspiration of Dr. Horowitz's MSIDS Lyme questionnaire and created a questionnaire for myself in practice where I'm scoring these different categories, lighter and heavier. So category one are really common things. It could be from other things. So they don't get scored as heavily as category three, which is more serious, more mold related and gets a heavier weight. And the nice thing about this questionnaire is it gives you a total mold risk that will tell you which way is the needle pointing? Is it not really mold sickness? Is it possible or is it going all the way to probable mold or biotoxin illness? Using this questionnaire, and by the way, I'm looking for practitioners who are willing to share their results. I'm trying to scientifically validate this. Um, so I'm looking for people that have a urine mycotoxin test or some way of their testing to confirm mold illness and a questionnaire score. And we're shooting for a thousand results. So if anybody's interested, please email me at support at drkrista.com. And um, if you would like a copy of this, a PDF version of this, printable version to use in clinic, you are welcome to it. Again, email at support at drkrista.com. And I hope you find it is a useful tool. So another way we can find mold is our diagnostic assessment. Your decision points when deciding whether to run a test is, is more information really required to guide your treatment? If you already know that you're dealing with somebody, they've discovered mold and they're exhibiting all of the symptoms and they have a questionnaire score of you know, a 15 or something like that that says probable mold, maybe you just go right into treatment. You also have to ask yourself, what information closes the decision gaps? Is it helpful to know which mycotoxin because they, you know it's mold related illness, but you don't know what mold you're dealing with. Sometimes you can find that on a urine mycotoxin test and it helps you close those gaps and point um, the building inspector into the right direction. Are you trying to establish a baseline? Are you reassessing treatment progress? Are you trying to do a comparison? Do you need the patient to have buy-in of themselves or their family? A lot of times we're running these tests on the patient's request as well, because they've heard on, on mold forums, you know, this is a way to look. Um, and are you looking for proof for some sort of occupational or landlord situation? Which test to choose really comes down to accuracy, cost, the comfort that you have with the existing models, and then what combination of testing maximizes strengths and minimizes weaknesses, because every lab test has those. So this is my first tier, what I call the direct test. We're looking directly for mold, mycotoxins, or the evidence of. And you know, no single test is gonna be diagnostic, so I usually do a combination. It's notable that on PE, you won't necessarily see fungal findings. People can be mold sick, terribly mold sick and mycotoxin sick. Like I've had atypical dementia, atypical MS, um, myocarditis, cancer diagnoses, where there was no fungal findings, but they were very mold sick. Skin rashes are classic for that. And they're, they're not fungal rashes. They're like desquamation or eczema or something like that. And it turns out mold was behind it. So the direct testing, the positive urine mycotoxin test for me is a very helpful test. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Sometimes if the patient is quite chemically sensitive, someone that can't even follow a car behind them that has like a stinky exhaust, or they can't go into the detergent aisle at the grocery store, they wouldn't even step foot into a target. Um, these people, I might run a glutathione first. However, I have to share that um, I have identical twin boys who have become my guinea pigs for all things testing. And I don't know if you know my story, but we ended up living in a mold sick house ourselves. And that's what prompted me writing my book is that I knew exactly what to do once the flood revealed itself and I realized we were dealing with mold. Well, I have one kid who was really good about taking the glutathione and one kid who wasn't. And I was doing split sample testing at that time to determine whether I was more comfortable with ELISA or mass spect. And I was really trying to figure out the two methods and running many split samples at that time. And the unique thing that I had was access to identical, genetically identical kids who had the identical exposure. And I knew what supplements they were on because I was the mom in charge. So I ran a urine mycotoxin test using the mass spec method and the, and the ELISA method. 
And I found that the glutathione changed the results on the mass spec. So it made some of the mycotoxins go away and reduce. So I am very cautious about provoking. And I know this is a very controversial statement because the understanding out there is you must provoke with glutathione. And I'm here to say all of the information that was gleaned from and the studies that were done using the mass spec method did not use provocation. And so I think it's very important that we don't get onto any kind of um, soap or uh, religion <laughs> with what we do before the test as far as provocation or not. Look at your own patient, use your clinical reasoning and see if this is a chemically sensitive person or they're really weak or they're really toxic and they can't even sweat, maybe start with a red blood cell glutathione or an oat to try to assess their glutathione status and whether that might be someone who could really benefit from having a provocation on a lab, but physically they might really hate you because if they're not detoxifying, picking the one master antioxidant that's gonna do that without supporting the whole body, they could really have some bad symptoms. So I'm just kind of trying to say, when people ask me, should we provoke or not? And I always say, well, we really don't know that yet. We don't have enough clinical studies out there that say with enough numbers of people, I know that my little tiny sample of two children who are identical <laughs> twins is not a large enough sample for us to really get the information. So what it did for me was cause me to pause and ask what, what is the right thing for my patient and is this necessary? And in order to answer the question of what we should do for the masses, I think we need some clinical studies. But I'll let you know that at least from my um, reading, the mass spec method really was done without any of that provocation. So um, take that and run with it. And let's, let's get some studies and before we really make any clean statements. But I, oops, I um, took you. Okay. But I will say that I do have a prep sheet, if anybody is interested, where I've taken some of the limitations out of that test. And, and um, I'm happy to share that with you as well at support at drkrista.com. I will also sometimes run a stool test, especially if they are digestively very affected. You can see a positive fungus and a positive candida and even a serum positive candida, IgE or IgG, is quite common in people who've had mold-related illness. Uh, we will talk about why that is. And a sputum culture, you may find fungus, but fungus is tenaciously adhered. It creates roots down into the tissue. And so you can't really, you're not gonna dislodge it like you would a bacteria. Uh, with a sputum culture. And then neuroquant is an MRI technique that can be quite useful. And, and I've learned a ton from Dr. Mary Ackerley on this. She's so willing to share her experience. Um, and she has shared that there, that's been useful in a few cases to get people out of leases or um, job requirements where they had to go into a moldy space. <sighs> Nature break. All right, so some indirect testing. Uh, visual contrast sensitivity is Dr. Shoemaker's um, brainchild and really smart idea. A lot of these mycotoxins act like alcohol. Just think about it. Where do we get alcohol? We get it from yeast fermentation. So what happens when you have too much alcohol? Your vision gets a little bleary, right? So this is a way to look at if somebody is being affected by mycotoxins that are affecting their visual processing. It also can affect the retina but also the visual processing in the brain, just like when you have too much alcohol. I will use this as, it's like $15, you can do it online. If I have somebody that's really neurologically affected, I will use this as sort of a scale for myself to find out how deeply is this gone into their nervous system? Are we at CNS now? You can have a negative VS, VCS test and still have a mold sick patient. But for me, it's an indicator of how far into the CNS have we gone. A CBC, you might see a low white count with a relative, we talked about that, relative lymphopenia. Uh, TMB cell total counts, that's gonna be a longer standing exposure with the, with the, the T, TMB cells and the IgG changing. But commonly, we will see a lower natural kill cell, killer cell function. Function is different than total, and I learned this from Dr. Joseph Brewer. These are given in lytic units, and you wanna have somebody 15 or over, less than seven is an abnormal, but to really win with mold, we have to boost that natural killer cell function and nothing does that like being outdoors. You can, might see a vitamin D deficiency. There is a receptor blockade at the intestines and the kidney by mold and mold mycotoxins. 
So mold turns people into sun phobic people. You will see people who are really mold toxic define themselves as artistic, a night owl, um, and they actually feel uncomfortable in the sun because that receptor blockade causes too much inactive vitamin D and it causes a feedback loop that makes them sun sensitive. So if somebody is really, really sun phobic, I'm like, hmm, what's going on with your mold mycotoxins? You might see an increased liver enzymes and you can especially see a GGT. I think that mold mycotoxins are a driver behind NASH and fatty liver that we're not paying attention to. You may see an IgE mold that's not useful for mycotoxins. There is a, an IgG test, a serum test for mycotoxins. I'm not super familiar with using it. I don't understand how to use it clinically because those numbers can be high for up to six months. So it doesn't help me really track the ups and the downs of the mycotoxins, but I think it's a useful thing for somebody who, if they are a terrible excreter, that might be another way to go. But an IgE negative mold does not equal not mold sick. So let me say this the other way around. I said a lot of negatives there. You can have a negative IgE mold. That's just a spore count. That's just a spore reaction, but they can still have mold sickness and that's related to mycotoxins. You can see an increased MMP9. This is a shoemaker lab. I'm not shoemaker trained, um, so I don't have a lot to say about that from the shoemaker side, but I can tell you this particular enzyme is a tissue repair enzyme. It will induce the immune system. So it'll stimulate the immune system to come in and chew up sick material so that repair can happen. And our colleagues, Drs. Raj Patel and Dr. Talia Farshan, recently had a discovery that this is related to MCAS. So they're using an MP MMP9 level to track how histamine and mast cell activated somebody is. And I think that's a really fantastic discovery because testing for MCAS is really terrible right now, unless you are at Mayo Clinic. <laughs> so that's kind of a neat little tool. An organic acids test can be really useful. You can see markers that show aspergillus, colonization, candida, fusarium, and um, glutathione depletion. This is one that I'll run maybe before mycotoxin just to see, is it worth running the mycotoxin on this person? Okay, so the discussion about the mycotoxin test, there was a, a study done, Dr. Brewer was part of this, where they tested normal controls and people with chronic fatigue syndrome, so sick patients. And they found fungus in everybody's sinuses. They did um, tissue biopsies of sinus, lung, gut, um, I think anything but brain. And they found that the, everybody had fungus in the sinuses, but only the sick people had positive mycotoxins on the washing and in the, in the urine. The healthy people had fungus there that is not spitting out mycotoxins. So I, that's when I was like, okay, there's something going on with the sinuses and the nose here. I've got to add that. And when I did add the nasal treatment, wow, did people get better, much better. Um, so I was definitely missing something. So there are methods that antigen antibody testing is an indirect method. The mass spec is a direct and is controlled for creatinine. Some considerations, you know, when you're choosing which method I've listed here, um, sometimes you're just trying to compare to a previous test. So you want to use the same method. Um, sometimes you want to make sure that you're using the method. Like I said, if somebody is really terrible excreter, maybe it's better to use a serum test. If somebody has, um, has to be on glutathione, then you might use the indirect method. But typically I'm finding that the mass spec has given me a better look at what's really going on with the patient. So Overall strengths are the levels do correlate to symptoms in my experience. And I've seen a lot of patients um, that when the mycotoxins go up, their symptoms tend to go up and vice versa. As we get those mycotoxins out of the body, the symptoms tend to go down. So it's a really great way to track your treatment progress. Overall weaknesses is there's varying accuracy due to the patient's excretion. There's also an unknown degree of contamination via ingestion and these can be inducible. Dr. Brewer had a, a single case study, so it's just one person, but after doing sauna, 125 degrees for I think it was 20 minutes, the mycotoxins went up four, at, at four to six hours later, went up tenfold. So we know these are inducible. So how long does it take it to go back to normal? And then do you have sort of a vacuum after that happens where you're seeing lower normals than you normally would because the person already had a massive excretion? We don't know. So these are some of our confounding factors. 
Did you pick the correct method for the situation? Did you do a random urine versus a first, first morning? I recommend all my patients do a first morning urine. That's on my prep sheet. So we're comparing apples to apples. Did they exercise? How, how long before, what type of exercise was it? And how long before we did the sample did we do the test? I typically recommend for people that are bad excretors to do a sauna the evening before. Um, and again, I talked about glutathione is for somebody who had a low glutathione on red blood cell glutathione or an oat. If they're in acute viral challenge, I tell them to skip the test and wait till later because I have seen that turn things negative. And then historical exposure might be a, um, a colonization. So a building that they were exposed to years ago moved into their body and their sinuses and gut and they're carrying that around with them and it's not actually in their built space currently. This happens in a um, minority of the time. Usually that's gonna be from an active building exposure, but not always, and that's what's wild. I have seen um, people who are mold sick, but the exposure was too limited. Their body was able to excrete and detoxify these mycotoxins into a different metabolite, turning a mycotoxin uh, negative or looking cleaner than it really is. Um, that's typically with athletes that have like these pristine clean diets and aren't eating a lot of mycotoxin infested grains. I've also seen intimate contact where the mold sick patient that was colonized is making their intimate partner sick, even though they are displaying, the intimate partner is displaying mycotoxin related symptoms, their, their mycotoxins can look completely clear on testing. So, you know, really use your clinical thinking on this. I just want to let you know some of the oddities. Typically, the majority of patients, they're in a water damaged building, they're actively being exposed, and that's where it's coming from. But in the end, it's your clinical decision. And if you'd like that prep sheet, you can email me. So for treatment, beware of misplaced optimism. There's a lot of misplaced optimism in mold sickness, and that is gets people in trouble. I'm in the favor of the pessimist who says our basement is half full and we are half cooked. <laughs> so here's my treatment approach. This is the therapeutic approach I was talking about. I do this in order, um, doing, and I might use everything all at once, but I'm really assessing with my patient if they're healthy enough to go on antifungals, which is the fifth phase, the fight. So basically it's layer one and two need to be done a hundred percent, just like you would peel an orange to get it the juicy stuff in the middle, which is three, four, and five. So layer one is avoidance. The most important treatment of any toxic illness is avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. So important. It takes up the first three steps. Number two is fundamentals. Number three is protect from mycotoxins and spores. Number four is repair from those, and number five is fight or antifungals. So beware of the avoiding the avoidance. Out of all of the environmental sick patients that I work with, mold sick patients are the most resistant to the fact that mold is the problem. So be wary of that and expect that. People take this personally, and I've had a recent student that took my class finally make, sense, make this make sense for me. They feel like you're judging their hygiene and how well they take care of their house, possibly. So they just want, and it's expensive, it's scary, it's overwhelming. And so they just like Homer go into the bush and just avoid it. So is it colonization or biofilm or what's going on? We see occupational studies where there's a lack of respiratory improvement following remediation. So what explains the symptom persistence despite the avoidance? So you have somebody who's done 100% avoidance, they got out of their exposure, even occupational exposure, home exposure, and they're still sick. So this is my theory, you're getting the Dr. Jill version of this. My theory is that something triggers a, a mechanism in your own flora. So water damage building exposure is the key and mycotoxins are the trigger or poisonous air. So the theory is if you've had, if you are a susceptible person and or you had sufficient exposure duration, these mycotoxins in the air trigger a protective mechanism in your own flora. That converts your healthy microbiome to act like a pathogenic biofilm. You'll have ongoing immune depletion from the poisonous or toxic air, also the endogenous toxin. That leads to an overall fungal overburden. And that may explain this persistence and the flares that somebody can get once they're all, they're all well and they're fine. And then they go to a moldy restaurant and they're completely sick again and everything comes back. So I think that, that that's what I'm using as my rationale for the effectiveness of antifungals without having to have a diagnosed infection. And because I'm using plants, I don't have to have it be a diagnosed infection to warrant using something as um, 
potentially problematic as a triazole drug. I get to use plants. And so it can, I can start to knock things back when it's colonization and get them recentered. So here are the fundamentals. Basic treatment guidelines you get from any naturopathic doctor. Get your circadian rhythm on, uh, in line, sleep and wake at the right times, make sure you're hydrating, and most sick people need spring water or soluted water because that ADH resistant. Using RO or distilled or purified is going to just go right through them. Get their digestion in check, get moving. Even if they're bed bound, they need to be doing ankle rolls or anything to keep moving. Mold wants to compost you. So it wants you to stay indoors, be afraid of the sun and don't move. Make sure people are working on their community, their spiritual and energetic or energetic practice if spiritual flips your patient out. This is where mold hits the hardest is that connection with source. And then a healthy diet. What does that mean? Okay, so this is from my book. I'm just gonna show it to you. You have the slides. I'll tell you the rationale. I have a first tier and a second tier. The first tier, most people can get rid of and feel a lot better. This may be from candida overgrowth, but I think of it as overall, it's a mycotoxin exposure. So some foods are prone to have mycotoxin contamination. Those are the foods I take people off for three days before we do the urine mycotoxin test. Some foods are just mold, <laughs> you know, moldy cheeses, mushrooms, that kind of thing, yeast. So we don't want to increase the fungal burden by ingesting those foods. And some foods are going to be increasing the carbohydrate load and increasing their fungal burden. So that's where the first tier foods, the rationale comes from. Second tier is just getting a little more nailed down on those things. So you have this for your reference for later. Beverages also. So, you know, you don't want to be having, and I get a lot of heat on kombucha because you're supposed to be able to take that to heal a fungal burden. Well, sure. If your fungal burden is because you've just had an antibiotic and you've got a candida overgrowth, or you're going into perimenopause, you have a hormone change and you're having trouble rebalancing your flora, that's a great time to use something like that. But when it's because of mold, kombucha can actually make your patient worse. So it can Saccharomyces boulardii. And I know that was controversial as well, statements. So what to eat to protect a body? Here are all the things that, again, I list the food and the reason. We're dealing with helping the liver, with detoxification, with bioflavonoids that have been shown to neutralize mycotoxins. We're trying to help the intestines. We're trying to help the kidneys rebalance with celery and cucumber. And then bitters, 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 bitters. I do restrict my patients typically to one fruit per day, sometimes two if they're an athlete and they're really working out. But because of that fungal overgrowth, they tend to do better on vegetables versus fruit. And then fat, 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 fat. If your toxin is fat soluble and the solution to pollution is dilution, then you have to do a ton of great fats. So I say copious, clean, correct fats. Alliterations help me in practice. So copious, clean, correct fats, which is the solution to the pollution. And then certain things that are gonna help you with detoxification that are, that are yummy, like turmeric, curry. And then there are mold fighting foods, things that are antifungal in nature, garlic, onions, scallions, chives, leeks, and then mold fighting spices. You have that all here. So you have to, I think, and from my experience in practice, fully peel that orange, full avoidance, in order to get better. The number one thing that I see in patients that are referred to me, and now I only consult with practitioners because I'm trying to, I'm really on a mission to train practitioners. So I'm not seeing as many patients as I used to, but I will tell you, it is unbelievable how many times someone has been sent to me after seeing a perfectly smart doctor who had a great protocol and they couldn't figure out why it wasn't working it was because they did not actually have an adequate remediation or the person did not get out of that mold exposure. Avoidance causes half peeled oranges, which causes chronically ill patients. Okay, so back to peel the orange. Now we move on to step three and four with protect and repair. Basically what this is, is we're trying to make, move, and eliminate bile. We're trying to dilute those fat-soluble toxins. We're trying to restore fat-soluble nutrients because the mold has interrupted the absorption of those. Use excessive amounts of bioflavonoids, specifically polyphenol-rich ones. And the way that I do this is I try to hit every color band in the rainbow. We assess the diet. And if they're not hitting a certain color band, we supplement it. So if they're really good about everything but red, because tomatoes make them ache, and they don't like beets because the turns their pea red and it causes 
um, <laughs> hypochondriacal moment, then we use lycopene as a supplement. Each of the colors of the rainbow, each of the bioflavonoids from resveratrol to folinic acid, to quercetin, to beta carotene, to lycopene, and I'm probably missing other ones, astaxanthin, zeaxanthin, all of these, they each have been shown in studies when animals, we don't have enough human studies, but they each color band has been shown to be powerfully effective against mycotoxins. So go for the full rainbow. There's a reason why your mother says to eat your vegetables. And then we do something to support the systems that detoxify my mycotoxins, specifically the liver, but not to forget the kidneys. We want to restore that mitochondrial function, rebuild the immune system, and choose treatments with multiple desired mechanisms of action so that you're not giving your patient pill fatigue. I have to make a statement on bile and binders. The primary target for binding, if you know anything about mold, you hear about binders. And so I just want everybody to really think about in, in the typical human food diet, if you're using the diet that I just showed you, and you're getting rid of the, and the diet I don't think is a permanent thing, it's just a temporary thing, but really paying attention to the mycotoxin laden foods and get them out of your diet. So, um, things that are mass produced. So mass production of corn, mass production of soy, mass production of wheat, um, using dairy where the cows have been fed mycotoxin laden food and then that concentrated into their milk. Those kind of things that we can get rid of, then your real primary target of the binder is not which thing binds which mycotoxin, it's what thing binds bile. So the secondary target is gonna be your foodborns. So the first target is mycotoxins. They are absorbed via the lung and the skin like we talked about in the beginning into the bloodstream. The blood delivers it to the liver and kidneys for detoxification, which is why we can find it on urine. Urine is a filtrate of blood. So that's, the, that's why we're looking there. So the blood delivers that to the liver and kidneys for detoxification. The liver will package them up into bile micelles. The bile is sent into the intestinal lumen, and then it's sequestered by the binder in the lumen to interrupt that recirculation. The liver is then forced to make new clean bile. So what are we binding? We're binding bile primarily. In my experience, binders as a sole therapy is not effective for the majority of my mold patients. If mycotoxins are the smoke, and the fungal overgrowth is the fire. What's making the mycotoxin? The mold, the fungus, so that's the fire. If you're just binding, 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 you're gonna be doing that for a very long time. Until, now some people, if you do just binding, they get better, it's the minority of my patient base. Now, of course, I have my own selection bias based on the people that I see, because they were strong enough and their immune system was strong enough to rebalance that flora. A lot of multi patients, binding is not gonna do it. And you can only make bile if you have the necessary components available. And the problem with long-term prescription binder use, like a cholestyramine or a cholecevalam, is that you can get nutrient depletion of those very things. So you can get depletion of phosphatidylcholine, which bile is 10 to 1 phosphatidylcholine to cholesterol. So you can get reduction of phosphatidylcholine. Now think about what that matters. That matters on your membranes. Can your cells intake nutrients and excrete waste? What about the people that are really what I call SNP rich and they don't process phosphatidylcholine? Um, cholesterol, so you see hormone depletion, B, HDL to VLDL ratios go off. Bile salt conjugates, bile salts are conjugated with glycine and taurine. Glycine is our chill out amino acid in our neurotransmitters. So you can see a lot more anxiety and taurine is incredible for our osmoregulation. It has a role in the CNS and a role in the retina. And then fat soluble nutrients such as CoQ10, A, D, E, K, and the essential fatty acids. Uh, again, on the referrals, I've had more than one patient who once just, all we had to do is take them off their binder and they really rebounded because they were nutrient depletion, depleted. And we restored those nutrients as well, of course. So I like to use pre-binders. There are so many mold sick people who are not moving bile. And because the bile gets gummed up. That's what gallbladder stagnation sludge is. So my focus before I add any binder is to make sure they're moving bile. And so this is some of the things that pre-binders can do. Cholaretics stimulate the production of bile in the liver and cholagog stimulate the bile flow. It also increases your secretory IgA. It will increase probiotic mucosal adherence, triggers the pancreas to secrete lipase, and lipase itself has antimycotoxin action, and it will protect against that intestinal barrier breakdown. That's pretty cool. 
So cholerectics and cholagogues, these are some examples. This really goes into more detail in my course, but these are some of the ways that some of the plants that I would use. I've found that liquid is more effective than pills. So if you have a patient that can't tolerate bitters or something like that, you can give them a pill form. You can give them these nutrients, choline, taurine, and glycine to help stimulate making more bile. And for some people, they need bile salts. They're going to need something to help them thin out that bile that through using something like an ox bile. Be careful though if they have a bile duct blockage with that. So I start with botanical binders. I will start with the pre-binders uh, if they are not having two bowel movements per day regularly. And then I'll add insoluble fiber, which is what my teacher, Dr. Walter Crinian, had found is a very good insoluble fiber or uh, bile binder. I've found that if you start really low and then you titrate up, you have more success because the body sort of needs to figure this out. Um, you don't want to cause constipation. The bile binding is an adsorption binding. That's a very weak bond. It's sort of like magnets. So if they're constipated, that's going to just like slide those things away from each other. So if you have constipation, that's a broken bond and you can get more intestinal epithelial damage. So I will always decrease or discontinue the binder before I ever add before I add more pre-binders. So basically I've had some people that are like, oh, well, I'll just keep them on the binder and then add more pre-binders. You're better off causing bile dump diarrhea than you are causing constipation with a mold sick patient. So daily we're using food and fiber. Food, we're using that five to seven servings of vegetables per day, hit all the colors of the rainbow, the majority being non-starchy ideally, and then using insoluble fiber. And then I'll pulse in stronger binders such as bamboo, carbonized bamboo, if I know I'm going to start them on an antifungal and I suspect a flare, or if someone had a mold exposure traveling or something like that. Here's some botanical binders that are, have been found to be very effective. Kale. This is in a um, cholecystectomy study. They found that steamed kale was a very effective binder of bile and helped slow bile dump diarrhea. Kale is also something that I've used with my constipated patients to help them go boop. So it's one of those amphoteric things that can go either directions. Aloe has also been shown to bind aflatoxin. I would imagine other toxins as well. And then okra, superfine ground, has been shown to be an adsorber of cholesterol. It also is um, providing some flavonoids. So the way that I use my insoluble fibers is I use two to five grams per day. That's going to be about one to two tablespoons. Um, dribble it out throughout the day. And um, these are the sources. And again, those are the other binders that I'll use if I know that we're going to really poke the bear. So back on the reminder, we've gone now all the way down to um, the restoration of fat soluble nutrients. Now we're talking about bioflavonoids and detoxification down to step four and five. The one thing we have to remember though is that immune restoration, remembering that there is a receptor blocker of vitamin D and vitamin D is potent immune regulator we want to make sure that we're optimizing that vitamin D. And I've put the reasons there. Things like repressing TGF-1, upregulating MMP9 expression, activation of the NERF2 transcription factor, all incredible things that vitamin D is doing to combat the specific ways that mold is ruining an immune system. I typically control my patients to between 60 and 90 nanograms per milliliter using emulsified. Remember, they're bile sluggish, so they're going to need emulsified forms of, of those fats. Bioflavonoids, I just am giving you one example. Green tea is one of the most potent bioflavonoids for mold-related illness. The polyphenols are really specific to green tea, are also incredibly effective against mold. And then that mixed microbial diversity thing that can happen in a moldy building, and remember the moldy building can move into your patient. So we have the nice thing about green tea is it's not only antifungal, but it's antibacterial, viral, and antitoxin, meaning mycotoxin. So there are specific ways that it's been shown to protect against specific my mycotoxins like aflatoxin, ochratoxin. Ochratoxin is really hard on the kidneys, and this is one beautiful thing that green tea does for the kidneys. The kidneys get forgotten a lot, so I like to talk about them. So one kind of interesting thing to note, note with green tea is it's a cytochrome P450 inhibitor. So if you have a patient on a drug that uses this, you want to make sure that you're, titrating or you're adjusting the dose or modifying. But what I find very interesting is that most things that are good for mold are cytochrome P450 inhibitors. Hmm. I think what's going on there is the body is wise enough to know that there's only so much glutathione to go around. So we have to slow down that phase one so that that intermediary 
metabolite is not going out there and ruining the person while we're waiting for enough glutathione to be around. So botanically, those things that mycodetox, turmeric is one of my favorite. And this is a picture I had the absolute pleasure and honor to be able to take in person at an organic turmeric farm in Costa Rica. And the orange, the brightness of this bioflavonoid, this just it did not come through on the picture. I wish you guys could be there and see it with me. It was amazing. So turmeric is curcuma longa is the plant. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this plant. It has antioxidant properties, hepatoprotective, nephroprotective, and then that epigenetic protection of the cells. So the specifically for specific mycotoxins, it's been studied for aflatoxin, um, and there is an ochratoxin study. I didn't have time to get that on the slide. Most of the studies, again, are in animals. So we have to do this kind of translational medicine when we look at what doses they're using on chickens and that kind of thing. So I'll share with you what I do is I start very low and I titrate slowly because I've seen people really crash on turmeric, especially multic people. So I will start at 350 milligrams once a day and then we kind of check out how they're doing. And granted, we're doing all the other stuff, the good fats and the bioflavonoids and all that. Again, to note, it inhibits cytochrome P450. So back to peeling the orange, there are lots of other things that you can do to protect and repair. I just gave you a sampling and now we go into the fight. So I use systemic and intranasal antifungals. This reduces recalcitrance in my patients. It reduces fungal resistance in my patients. And what I'm choosing, I'm looking at what's the health status of my patient? Are we talking infection or colonization? If it's infection, I will often do a combination of herbs and pharmaceuticals. And what's the location? If it's a skin thing, also add a skin cream that's antifungal. Help your patient out. Um, so botanical medicines, because they're high safety profile, like I said before, infection is not required. So uh, there are lots of botanicals that are not only antifungal in their own right, but have been shown in studies to reduce um, drug resistance of these fung fungi, not just candida. We have studies that are showing that some of these mycotoxins are also reducing resistance of aspergillus and other things that we might find in an indoor environment. So really what we're looking for here is the sulfur containing compounds, allicin and allium in garlic. And the ethanol prep was the most effective against multi-drug resistant candida. So I typically use tincture. Uh, it's not only anti fungal, but we see that it's antimicrobial against staph aureus, E. coli, pseudomonas, which is a big problem for people with chronic sinusitis. Pseudomonas travels all over. It causes like urinary problems, prostatitis, sinusitis, and that bugger is hard to get at. So garlic helps with that. It's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory, cardiovascular protective, has anti-cancer properties, hepatoprotective, nephroprotective, neuroprotective, GI protective, anti-diabetic, and anti-obesity. What doesn't garlic do? Some patients do not tolerate high sulfur containing foods. And in that case, I often go looking for a molybdenum deficiency, optimizing that, and usually they can tolerate the garlic. Time is another one that's an alternate. If you have a patient who does not tolerate sulfur at all because of a genetic SNP, um, I'm thinking about our colleague, Dr. Greg Nye and his new book, if you guys haven't seen it. Um, and that's all about sulfur. So some people can't, and that's okay. We have lots of options. So time is my other favorite. What I love about time is its safety profile. This I'll use with peds. I'll use this with eaty beady babies. We can put them in a time bath, um, all kinds of ways to get time into a body and it's incredibly safe. It's a very reliable broad spectrum antifungal and antibacterial. It has action again against fluconazole resistance. Um, I did not find an itraconazole study. I would love to see that. Um, and that's for Aspergillus fumigatus, which is a very common foodborne mycotoxin. And then the common kind of body things, okay, athlete's foot and candida. Uh, it has an inhibitory effects against aflatoxin, which is cool. That means not just against the, the mold that's causing aflatoxin. <laughs> so it's not just getting at the mold itself. It's actually neutralizing the mycotoxin, which is so cool. And like I said, very high, high safety profile. And we were seeing that even in concentrations two times higher than the effective dose to kill the fungus was still quite safe over long term. Here are some intranasal antimicrobials that I might use. I, again, always combine the systemic with the intranasal because of that study. Thank you, Dr. Joseph Brewer. 
And that is giving me, had, when I added the intranasals, people had, their resilience came back. They could go to a moldy restaurant, and while that's not ideal, it's gonna happen. So you have to get these people ready for real life. So these are some of the things that I might use. And I have a video out there on how to make your own essential oil nasal spray. So you can go to YouTube or send, my, send your patient to my uh, website. It's on my video blogs page, or they can just put in essential oil in the search bar and find this video and learn how to make their own. Democratization of medication. <laughs> It's so one of the things that's really powerful, you can see on this B is propolis. So powerful against mold, reduces mycotoxins, neutralizes mycotoxins of the sinuses. But my only ask there is if you're using it as a medication, please do something to support the bees. They are really struggling. Okay, so I am at time, I'm about five minutes over. I'm going to go ahead and go through a case, unless Sarah, if you want me to stop here and do questions, because you have the information of the case. Um, in the slides. Yeah, we're, we're good if you want to run through the case and then we can do questions or if okay. you have kind of a hard stop, we can go to questions now. It's up to okay. you. I don't have a hard stop. So I'm hoping everybody that's on um, has a little extra time. I'll just talk through the case so you can hear what my um, thinking was with it. And um, then we can take questions and those that need to jump off can jump. All right. So I won't take it personally, you guys. I went a little over. So here's our case of low T and ED. This is a 28-year-old 20, male. He had a desk job, was in a committed long-term relationship. This is a patient that I've seen for a very long time. This is one that I saw when I first started practice, um, probably uh, 2003. So um, he's, I know him well. And um, what was interesting is he was starting to have these symptoms since he moved into his new apartment. And after COVID, he had to start working from home and all his symptoms became much worse. This is someone that was really dedicated to a healthy lifestyle, like really clean diet, um, a workout, crazy person, um, you know, I mean, really, really dedicated to health. So we were seeing, oh, that's an interesting typo, increasingly, <laughs> I'm sorry about the typo guys. So increasingly lower sex drive, occasional erectile dysfunction, wasn't able to really tie that to a fight with his girlfriend or stress or alcohol use or anything like that, and really didn't use alcohol all that much. It was more like social times. Started having a UTI feeling after intercourse, overall increased urinary frequency, had some hair loss and some dry skin, muscle mass loss despite his very dedicated weight training program. And he was one of those people that um, in the early days, I think would overtrain, but really got into a place where I think he was doing a good job of managing the weight training and not overtraining. Started to have hay fever. This is a new thing for him. There's another little mm, new onset food sensitivities, new onset hay fever allergies. You got to look at the environment that person's in. New problem with acid reflux and would say that his digestion would just stop after eating simple carb meals. And in that he included vegetable meals where the vegetables weren't cooked. So raw veggies would cause his digestion to just stop. Started to have low blood pressure issues and sometimes heart palpitations during deadlifts. A new anxiety, it wasn't really affecting his sleep, but he would wake feeling really unrefreshed. So he feels like maybe it's affecting my sleep and I just don't know it, but he could fall asleep okay. And if he woke at night, was able to get back to bed or back to sleep. And that's kind of unusual for someone who's sleeping in their mold environment, which he was. Started to get jock itch and we did find a um, candida infection and uh, tested positive for trichoderma, which is a, a thing that we see with jock itch and um, fatigue. On UA, I just kind of did a, let's just see where we're at now. Um, you know, with the fatigue, I was worried and the, his age, I was thinking, well, it could be EVV. With the urinary symptoms, I want to make sure he didn't have a UTI. And I forgot to write on here, we did do STI testing as well, which was all negative. So UA was all normal. CBC, his white count had dropped to 4.0, which was unusual for him. We didn't see the relative changes as much, just a slight eosinophilia. Uh, albumin started to drop and that was really, that got me thinking about ochratoxin um, because that's one of the things ochratoxin does. Starting to increase the liver enzymes. So he was usually in the teens and now he was starting to be in the high 20s. EBV, we saw slight high titers and we ran an early antigen and he did have slightly high early antigen. 
um, mild reflux on, he wanted to go in and get an upper GI because he was like, I know something's wrong. Maybe I did, maybe I lifted too hard and I caused a hernia. And this was really directed by him. He really wanted that upper GI. Um, I think it was his like, his male brain, <laughs> no offense to men, but you know, like if I see some problem, then it's really there. Uh, so I ran a 24 hour urine hormone and here you see he's low on everything. Estrogens, um, estrogen metabolites, DEA, DHEA, testosterone, low androstenediol, and then a high cortisol and high cortisol metabolites. He also had a high, there's another one, height. I was really into putting T's into this presentation. I was thinking low T must be. So high 5-alpha reductase, this may be mold, this may be just be genetic, um, but we see a high 5-alpha reductase and we see a low progesterone. Low oxytocin, and um, which might be some of that bonding stuff with his partner. Normal thyroid, I was shocked. I thought we would see some thyroid changes and normal melatonin. On my questionnaire, he scored a 12, which is probable mold. So just based on the fact that it all started after moving into this apartment and having to be in it more, we went in ahead with a mycotoxin test. And this is what we saw. I put the norms there on the Vibrant Lab and the mold that these are related to. And this is what we saw. He was high ochratoxin, high fumos fumonisins, can never say that one, not high, but you know, starting to creep. And his arelanone was through the roof. That is an estrogenic mycotoxin. That is an endocrine disruptor mycotoxin. The ochratoxin is a kidney toxin. So you can kind of see like his kidney jing was just getting nailed. Uh, so we did test the apartment and what's really interesting, and I'm not a building expert. I, I don't try, I try not to answer any building related questions because I feel like we went to school to be doctors. We are not building experts. <laughs> and I know I'm like on a soapbox about this because I have made my patients worse thinking that I could guide their testing and remediation and then giving, having it done improperly, not getting rid of the mold or not finding mold when it was there. And that gave everybody a false sense of confidence. And we went chasing around for other things only to find out when they decided to remodel that indeed there was mold. So there are, they tested the vents. And I think, you know, there's a few companies out there that are looking to like only test the vents. Um, if you note, the vents only showed a weekly positive aspergillus penicillium, which is where the ochratoxin was coming from. But when they went in and it was a very good inspector, this is someone that I work with all the time, all the rest of the air sampling, all the rest was basically clear, but the furnace coils were incredibly high on fusarium. And that's what was giving him his xarelinone. After this discovery, he started a search for a new apartment. So here's what we did. Dietarily, he already had a pretty pristine diet. So we added extra, um, we added extra, extra virgin oil, <laughs> olive oil, because I'm trying to dilute, dilute, dilute those mycotoxins. We added one to two tablespoons of ground pumpkin seeds. I was going for pumpkin seeds for their testos testosterone effect and their insoluble fiber effect at binding the bile. Um, for supplements, we did tons of DHA. You're gonna look at that and say, what? Three grams daily of just the DHA? Yes. In the beginning, I start very high with my good fats because we are trying to dilute out these toxins that are getting into the central nervous system. And the building block of the central nervous system is DHA. Um, DHEA, we did to try to to get his levels up, to try to make his own testosterone and pregnenolone for the same reason, to try to hit the broad spectrum, because I knew we were getting rid of the reason, which was xerolinone, and we were going to be boosting him to make his own natural. If that wasn't working, after three months, we were gonna um, start him on testosterone replacement therapy. He was able to restore most of his function, and we did put him on testosterone for about six months, very low dose. Quercetin, that's a bioflavonoid. I used liposomal. Hawthorne solid extract I did for the heart. One thing we know about ochratoxin is it is it can cause um, some bundle branch blocking or AV blocking in the heart. And he was having palpitations when he was putting his respiratory or his cardiovascular system under stress. Hawthorne is fantastic for that. And solid extract is not the worst medicine to be given. If you've ever tasted it, it's so yummy. So, and then we use turmeric to help his kidneys and his liver detoxify. It's also an anti-neural inflammation. He was having these anger outbursts. So I was like, okay, we're gonna try to hit some, one thing that has multiple mechanisms of action. Turmeric is also great for the gut. 
So it will help him reduce that reflux feeling. Of course, we know the refluxes from uh, with that clean of a diet and a, and a clean upper GI and no hiatal hernia. We see reflux commonly from that um, irritation of the mycotoxins on the, rest, on the GI lining. Aloe juice we added for the reflux that really chilled out his reflux um, symptoms. Bile salts with dinner to try to get that digestion from not stopping anymore. So we're trying to thin out the bile and induce digestion. He was able to have an extra bowel movement. He was pretty good about having one a day, got him up to two per day with the bile salts at dinner. Intranasal, he used an essential oil blend. And because he was having actual fungal symptoms, the jock itch, I did use the combination for him of pharmaceuticals with plants. Sometimes I will start with plants and we'll assess it for three to four weeks and see if his body was strong enough to go. But he was very motivated to get rid of that because it was aesthetically not you know, I mean, he's a guy and it was happening in the guy spot. So he wanted to have that rash gone. Um, so, you know, as doctors, we have to meet our patient where, where they're at. So we started with time tincture as a loading dose so he wouldn't have a big die off. And then we added the itraconazole, which I did pulsed. Sometimes you need to actually do a loading dose of itraconazole as well, because you will get that first pass liver effect. Um, for him, since we were doing the bile salts, I felt like we could just add it in pulsed. We did that pulsed itraconazole with another antifungal that also has antiviral, which is olive leaf for the EBV. We did that for probably three months. And then we removed the pharmaceutical after the rash got better, plus a couple weeks because fungus is tenacious, and finished with botanicals an additional month. And what I do is I treat until I see a zero mycotoxin, which we did get in his case, which was fantastic. So that's my case. How my mission makes your job easier as a practitioner is I want to save you time in clinic. I have loads of free information for patients on my website. I keep, I do think that as video because people with mold can't read very well. Um, and they're very short because the attention span is not there. I have handouts. I have courses that are free for the public. I try my best with social media. Um, so there's my website, drkrista.com, and I invite you to build your mold literacy by taking my online course called Are You Missing Mold Illness? And you'll find that on my courses page. So thank you very much for your time and your attention, and we'll hit some questions. <laughs>